uh, honest thesis in this area, and hence we invited her to speak in this. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. As he said, my name is Lauren. I'm a geophysics honors student with the Earthbike Group at the University of Sydney, and I'm here today to talk about my honors project modeling the evolution of the Aramega Sea in the context of tectonics, geodynamics, and surface processes. And my supervisors for this were Sabine Zahirovich, Dietmar Mueller, and Tristan Sauz. So first of all, a bit of an introduction as to why I'm here today. So our research group over at the School of Geosciences has heard much about the Sydney Informatics Hub and the CTDS, specifically the tools and talents they have at their disposal to help with a range of different research projects. So particularly, we're really excited about uh, the potential to work with the data science team to optimise some of our long-term, uh, large-scale landscape evolution models. Um, so today, um, I guess I'm going to present, uh, I guess at the moment, the, uh, the models we're running and the parameters that go into them remain a bit vague and unclear to everyone over here. So the purpose of my talk is to clarify what we do, the models we run, and how we think you guys can help us. And I'll do this through taking you through my honours project as it's really at the forefront of what we're doing in terms of these um, continental scale landscape evolution models. And we're really excited about these models as it's the first time we've been able to simulate the interplay of multiple different processes which were all previously modelled separately. So thank you very much for having me and feel free to ask any questions at any point in time. So just a bit of a seminar outline. First of all, I'll take you through uh, an introduction to my project. I'll then spend a bit of time on the methodology, uh, specifically the boundary conditions, the model parameters, and their uncertainties, as it is at this stage that we really need the help of the data science team. Um, to show you the capabilities of the models and the nature of the output, I'll then go through the results and how we ground truth the models using observational data, and then highlight the key findings and implications of this work as well as the avenues we've identified for future work through the study. So the Aramanga Sea is uh, an empiric epicontinental seaway that was formed through the combined effects of higher global sea levels, as well as the dominant effect of a phenomenon known as dynamic topography on the eastern portion of Australia during the Cretaceous. Thus far, several generations of models, such as that by Sauz et al. 2017, have provided valuable insight into the evolution of this Aramega Sea. However, due to difficulties in constraining the initial topography, as well as uncertainties regarding plate tectonic reconstructions, rather than having this uh, Aramega Sea drain to the northern Proto-Pacific Ocean, as required by the Paleogeographic and Sedimentary Record, this sea in fact drained to the embryonic Southern Ocean. So accordingly, the aim of this project was to link Earth's processes across spatial and temporal scales to better understand the evolution of the Aramega Sea, as well as Eastern Australia more broadly in a tectonic, geodynamic and surface processes framework. Um, and with this, the primary objectives were to develop a continental scale landscape evolution model of the Australian continent that both predicted the northern drainage of the Aramega Sea um, through the Gulf of Carpentaria into the Proto-Pacific Ocean in the Cretaceous, which is about 100 million years ago, and also reproduce the Murray-Darling Basin at present day, specifically its southern drainage and the geometries of its primary river networks. So in order to uh, develop these models, we've broken this year down into four main steps, including modeling mantle flow and dynamic topography, uh, establishing the initial and boundary conditions for the surface processes and models, uh, the initial phase of surface processes modelling and a sensitivity analysis, followed by the final phase of surface processes modelling and the ground truthing. So now I'll just spend a bit of time deconstructing uh, what goes into the models so you can have a better understanding of the parameters. So here we have a flow diagram that shows how the models work. Um, in the top uh, row there, we have the model parameters, including the initial conditions and boundary conditions that go into the models. So on the left, in the purple, we have what we term the discrete inputs in the sense that for each of the parameters, there is a number of different discrete models to choose from. So these can include dynamic topography and also global sea level. And then on the right in the red, we have inputs that could be said to have a probability distribution in the sense that there is a uh, most likely value and then a series of less likely values. 
and these include uh, mean initial elevation, precipitation, the erodibility coefficient and tectonic topography. So these six things feed into the model and from that we get a landscape evolution model that can then be uh, refined and validated based on known uh, observational data, including present day topography, sediment thicknesses, river geometries, uh, exhumation histories, paleo coastlines and sediment provenances. And so for my study, I only used um, two of these down the bottom, the present day topography and the river geometries. And so I'll focus on these towards the latter half of the presentation. So now I'll just go through uh, each of the top six parameters uh, individually so you can understand uh, what they are, um, the nature of them and their uncertainties. So beginning with the discrete inputs, we have dynamic topography. So dynamic topography is essentially the surface expression or the topography due to convection in the mantle. So it is a, a space-time series um, and they will be input into the model at um, varying time intervals, say five to 10 million years, depending on the dynamic topography model. Now these models can vary based on a few things, including the plate tectonic reconstructions used to generate them, as well as the geodynamic model setup. And as an example, we have a, a model of dynamic topography down in the right corner, whereby we see um, the topography depicted through the different colors, uh, ranging from minus 1600 meters to positive 600 meters. And uh, these amplitudes actually themselves are not that well constrained. And so we also have the option of scaling these amplitudes in the models between uh, 1 and say 0 0.65, which we actually did in the study and we'll see that a bit later on. So in regards to dynamic topography, where the data science team is concerned, uh, we will do most of the processing on our end. However, what we'll do is essentially provide uh, you guys with a series of models, say 10 to 15, and from that, it's about seeing uh, which models work best with the other parameters to uh, produce the best results. So the next discrete input we have is uh, global sea level, which is a time-dependent boundary condition but does not vary spatially. So as we can see on the right there, we have uh, different sea level curves, and whilst we do have are reasonable constraints on sea level. Uh, they do uh, vary somewhat, and we have different peaks and troughs, for example, which have uh, significant implications for the landscape evolution models in terms of the timing of uh, transgression and regression of the coastline. Um, so the idea is that here we'll test um, alternative models, say between five and 10, and um, again, see which models work best with the other parameters. So we then have uh, the inputs that could be said to have a probability distribution. So the first is the mean initial elevation, which is essentially the elevation of the continent at the start time of the model, which in our case was 205 million years ago. So this is just a singular grid um, at the model initiation time. An example of, it, of this is uh, this figure here whereby we have most of the Australian continent um, in this creamy colour has a value of 300 metres, and we have other uplands which are 600 metres, and then marine environments, which are progressively lower in elevation. Um, however, each of these values, whilst we do have data and proxies to constrain them, uh, they're quite uncertain. And so we think perhaps that each of these values can be represented by some sort of Gaussian or normal distribution whereby we have our uh, priori estimate of 300 meters, but then a series of other values ranging from 100 to 600 meters that can be um, alternately tested and um, uh, opt optimized. So this is the main initial elevation. The next one we have is tectonic topography, which would be progressively input into the model um, as it continues to run. So tectonic topography is the uplift or substance of continents related to movements of the lithosphere. So this will be input as space-time series uh, grids at varying uh, intervals again, and each will include different tectonic events. So for example, around 100 MA, we have the rifting of Antarctica, um, which is associated with substance, whilst at the same time we have this Australian Antarctic rift shoulder developing along Southern Australia, which is associated with uplift. So again, we have our best estimates uh, for these values, but uh, they are not that, that, that well constrained. So in our model, we included uh, this list of uh, tectonic events, and we can see they all have different timings and uplift values. 
and we can we tried to constrain this through uh, literature searches and etc but um, they're only uh, again our best estimates so we think uh, a variety of values can be tested based on some sort of distribution to get the optimal values um, and so the next one is what is called the erodibility coefficient which um, essentially describes how hard or how easy it is to erode the landscape. So uh, the erodibility coefficient is based on lithology or rock type. And so in that sense, it varies uh, spatially and temporally. So what we're looking uh, for, however, in this uh, model is two representative values for Western and Eastern Australia, which describes how um, they erode over time. So in my study, I developed an erodibility con uh, grid divided based on the Tasman line, which is this a white line here, um, whereby Western Australia was harder to erode than Eastern Australia, using the logic that Western Australia is older, and therefore Eastern Australia is um, uh, less, un less consolidated and uh, more susceptible to erosion. So we've chosen these values here, but again, um, these are really estimates that we try to refine through iterative model runs. Um, but the idea is that this can be optimized, this process can be optimized and automated. And uh, are, yes? Are those, are those numbers like well constrained in any specific location? Uh, no. So, I mean, you can, ideally, you can really refine this, and for each sort of lithology across Australia, you can have a different erodibility. Yeah. Um, but it's very complex, and you can, that can vary with time as well. But we couldn't capture this in our model at all. And so we discussed it a lot and we have, as I said, like te tectonically, Eastern Australia is younger and therefore we use the logic less consolidated. And also we have in Western Australia, the preservation of Mesozoic weathering profiles, um, which indicates very, very low erosion rates. So that was the logic we used, but um, it's not all accurate, yeah. So the final one we have is precipitation or rainfall, which is arguably the most complex and difficult to constrain parameter. And this is because the precipitation value at each node, at each time step is variable and can itself be arguably represented by some sort of probability distribution. So what we did uh, in this study, we used a combination of uh, reconstructed lithology data and also um, uh, existing climate models. So we have an example here of reconstructed lithology data, whereby we use the logic that uh, such lithologies as coal or mangroves um, represented uh, areas where precipitation exceeded evaporation, whilst uh, lithologies such as evaporites indicated the converse. So using those data points, we then um, extracted the precipitation values for an existing model by Herald et al. 2008 and then calculated averages, precipitation averages for each of these lithologies. So coal, for example, is 1.2 millimeters per, millimeters per year. And then where and when that lithology dominated, that average value was used. However, we did this very, very simply in my study. Uh, we ended up only using three different values for precipitation. However, the, the hope is that through working with the data science team, we can create much more uh, detailed, spatially and temporally uh, precipitation grids um, and thus get more accurate outputs for our landscape evolution models. So these are all of the parameters that go into the models. I'll now show you uh, the outputs that we can come up with. So uh, these are our initial models we were working with. So using this paleo topography, initial topography, we came up with these model outputs here. And the two rows uh, indicate two different scalings of the dynamic topography amplitudes, which I mentioned earlier. However, in all cases, at each time step, the model performs very poorly. At 100 MA, we can see that um, almost the entire continent is inundated, as seen in the blue. And then at, 100, at 0 MA, uh, the models look nothing like Australia. So uh, we required series modifications, and we, requ uh, we decided to do this to the paleo topography. So we decided to incorporate um, a higher resolution of variability in the um, elevation. So we had these remnants of fold belts along Eastern Australia, uh, which we put as uplands, and also this broader area of 
um, uplands across Western Australia, which reflected the fact that during the mid Mesozoic, say 100, uh, 200 to 150 million years ago, Australia was straddling this African mantle super swell, which was such a, an upwelling of mantle pushing the continent upwards. So we tried to capture that in this paleo topography and changing this and nothing else, the results were much improved. So we can see that at 100 MA, we have this semblance of an epicontinental sea. And then at, at zero MA, the, both of the models look a lot more like Australia, which is promising. So we had, I, uh, I guess, validated to an extent the modifications we used, we did to the paleo topography. And having identified other optimal parameters, I'll now show you the models that we came up with. So this is a high resolution landscape evolution model, which runs from 205 million years ago to the present. It uses the refined paleo topography I just showed you, uh, tectonic, tectonic events such as the Australian Antarctic Rift Shoulder, which prevents the southern drainage of the epicontinental sea, which only drains to the north, uh, that closes up and then towards uh, present day, we have the uplift of the eastern highlands, um, as well as the southern drainage of the Murray Darling Basin, uh, which is what we wanted. So we're happy in that we achieved both of our two objectives. Um, however, we needed to, we wanted to interrogate the models further and I guess validate and ground truth the decisions that we made regarding the parameters. So uh, we did this through um, a few different mechanisms, both through time and uh, at present day. So we, the way we validated the model output through time is through a comparison to previous work and some paleo geography data, which I'll go through in a moment. And then at present day, we also tried to ground truth the data uh, through a comparison to present day topography and uh, an evaluation of the predicted river drainage networks. So now I'll go through this a bit. So at 100 MA, we did a comparison to the previous work from South et al. 2017, which was that study I mentioned at the beginning. So on the top there, we have the predicted topography at 100 MA from the South, South study on the left, uh, this study in the middle. And then we compare both of these uh, model outputs to paleogeographies from Struckmeyer et al. 1990. And these paleogeographies essentially indicate uh, using the geological record whether an environment was uh, marine or fluvial or uplands, uh, etc. So immediately looking at them, we can see um, the opposite drainage of the epicontinental sea and the vast improvement in our uh, prediction of, uh, in our match to the paleogeographies. So we think this is due to the refinements to the paleotopography, uh, the scaling of the dynamic topography, and also our inclusion of such events as this Australian Antarctic group shoulder, which uh, prevented that southern drainage. Uh, so whilst uh, this is an improvement, you might also notice the offset in timing um, of the extent of flooding. So both models predict a maximum flooding at 100 MA compared to the paleogeographies, which indicate a time of 125 MA. Now we believe this is due to uh, a few things, including the absolute plate motion model, uh, which defines how the plate reconstruction moves over time. Also uncertainties in the sea level curves and uh, a few other things. Um, so whilst we understand this, we didn't have time to address it in our study. So we flagged this for uh, areas for future work. And so in order to validate the models at present day, uh, we did a comparison to present day topography using uh, what is known as residual topography, which in this instance is the difference in elevation between our model output at present day and a digital elevation model, which essentially captures our, our present day landscape. So on the top there, we have uh, the model output at present day from the SOW study, this study, and then the digi digital elevation model, so what we see it today. And on the bottom, we have the residual topography, whereby areas of red indicate overestimations in topography and areas of blue indicate underestimations. So focusing on the Eastern Highlands, first of all, this was something we wanted to improve as the study by Sows et al. Uh, produced highlands too high and too broad to match the observed top topography. So our highlands presently are about 400 kilometers uh, in width along the length of the margin. However, those by Sows were uh, consistently 1,000 kilometers um, and with a maximum of 1,500 kilometers. So we were able to improve this through reducing the dynamic topography scaling 
and we can see we have a better match in the uh, geometries of the eastern highlands, consistently being within 50 kilometres of the observed uh, highlands. Now, we also wanted to improve the prediction of Western Australian topography. This was something that was not really addressed in the South study, um, and accordingly, they underestimated the topography a bit. Um, so we want to do height in this elevation. And as I said, we did this through uh, heightening the elevation of Western Australia at the start time of the model, um, as I showed in that earlier slide. And uh, the result of this was an improvement. As we can see, most of Western Australia is this whitish colour in the residual topography, which indicates a, a very good match to the um, observed topography. So we think this validates to an extent uh, this, this decision, the decisions we made regarding the initial topography. And so finally, um, we wanted to ground truth uh, the, the outputs through an evaluation of predicted river drainage networks. So you remember a key objective of this uh, project was to reproduce the Murray-Darling Basin at present day, uh, specifically its southern drainage. So here, uh, we can see that we actually did this to an extent. On the left, we have the predicted Murray-Darling Basin in the black. And on the right, we have the observed Murray-Darling Basin with both showing the primary uh, river networks, including the Darling, the Lachlan and the Murray. And just qualitatively looking at, we can see that there's um, a bit of a match there, uh, both with the, the geometry of the basin and the rivers themselves, which is quite significant as we essentially let uh, the river networks develop independently uh, by themselves from 200 million years ago to the present in the model. However, we wanted to quantitatively assess this a bit further, and we did this through a comparison between the predicted uh, river networks and the observed uh, recorded in Chinoda et al. 2014. So looking at the Darling River specifically, which is this long one uh, running here, uh, we can see that we predicted a distance to outlet from the head to the mouth of the river of 2,900 kilometres compared to the recorded value of 2,800 kilometres. And similarly, the maximum elevation along this river was predicted at 770 metres compared to Chinoda's 1,000 metres. So we believe both of those are quite reasonable and again, uh, suggest improvements and success of the model uh, and validate the choices we made regarding the model parameters. So having, having said that, uh, shown the models, there's a few key findings and implications I'll highlight, which show, I guess, what we can get out of these kind of models. So first of all, these models uh, provided insight regarding the heightened elevation of Western Australia during the Mesozoic uh, due to its position over the African mantle superswell. And this was validated through uh, the good match uh, Western Australia had with the residual topography. So further, these models also highlighted that to get the northern drainage of the Aramanga Sea, uh, this required an ephemeral Australian Antarctic rift shoulder down the bottom which we were able to constrain to about 100 metres, which is significant as not much work at all has, been, uh, gone, has gone into looking at this event. And finally, um, this study revealed the necessity of scaling dynamic topography amplitudes, which were deemed reasonable in the study between uh, positive and negative 1,000 metres. And this is significant as it's an indirect um, means to constrain dynamic topography, which itself is a very... Um, uncertain for, uh, parameter. And so associated with this are several implications and applications. So through this study, I developed a replicable workflow for the generation of continental scale landscape evolution models, uh, which is significant in that it facilitates a greater understanding into the mechanisms influencing surface processes, but also provides uh, um, tools with which to constrain the uncertainty surrounding these mechanisms such as the Australian Antarctic Rift Shoulder. Um, and furthermore, in the industry, um, the successful exploration of hydrocarbons requires a comprehensive understanding of a basin sedimentation history. Um, so in this regard, uh, we believe these models have uh, significant potential to aid future exploration efforts. So that is, whilst these models are quite preliminary, um, I guess the second or third iteration uh, of these models, we do have the capacity to predict stratal units as seen here and synthetic cores uh, over there, which have, um, can really enhance our understanding of a basin sedimentation history at any particular point. Um, having said this, there is uh, many avenues we've identified for future work. 
So first of all, we believe that uh, in the future, models will require the coupling between the G-plates um, plate tectonic reconstruction software with the Badlands uh, surface processes modeling code in order to incorporate uh, deforming plate motion models that better capture lithospheric processes, which were only crudely captured um, in our models through the tectonic topography. Um, we also hope to test multiple absolute plate motion models, which is again to do with the plate reconstructions to help constrain the timing of that sea, which was offset by about 25 million years. And of course, we hope to better constrain the precipitation data and sea level curves, which were only very simply uh, incorporated in these models. And we hope to do this through the incorporation of formal model optimization um, to run ensembles of models using the supercomputers uh, through our collaboration with the CTDS and the SIH to um, uh, automate the optimization process that was only manually undertaken in the study. And thank you. That's it. Uh, how long do they take to run? Um, so it depends. If we did most of the uh, study with low resolution models, which were, say, nodes every 25 kilometers. And they only took um, three minutes to run on my, on my laptop. And the high resolution models, which were uh, nodes every five kilometers, would take um, about a day and a half. And, and then ultimately, Yeah. So I guess we were trying to optimise the parameters uh, in the low res, change, making all the changes, and then um, it actually translated quite well to the, the, the high resolution models. And, um, so you use like a fixed, we uh, so have this initial um, elevation. Yeah. And then uh, the algorithm is the same as this. Um, no, I don't think so. No. So, yeah. I was imagining this, it would be just quite complex, right? It's quite near to the scale in the sense that support, I guess it's not that simple. If you add some human knowledge, um, like the intro, I would have a significant change, uh, something like the, the, the node value, like the same. Yeah. Yeah. So, we'll say, for example, that. Um, Rift shoulder down the bottom there. Um, actually, I have a slide for this. I'll show you. So, I tested a few different values for this rift shoulder, and this is the output Murray Dunn Basin. So, it worked at say 550 and 100 meters, but then as soon as I went to 150 meters, this was the whole Murray Dunn Basin. So, it didn't drain south at all. It couldn't get through that um, bridge. Right, but that's quite a significant sort of Six macro four. parameter. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so you mean like lesser? Thinking, you know, you know when you like the actual where all those tributaries form and stuff. I would imagine is is, is determined by like the numerical. Mm -hmm. It is. Know, it's like the easiest path to go. So like you know, you, you you have this um the, the initial elevation is defined on some irregular field. Um, yeah. So where the initial, just the, the sort of numerical noise, so to speak, in that I would imagine it has a lot to do with, you know, uh, uh, determining. So I was just wondering if you explore just adding more, rather than like changing like a big parameter like sort of mm -hmm. what is, what is shown here, but just adding noise to the elevation. Um, I'm just wondering if that's something that should sort of be included in the sense that for a given initial yeah. macro elevation model, like different realizations of maybe just really low level Gaussian noise would be quite significantly changed. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I yeah. think so. I think it definitely could. The original um, elevations were pretty flat, weren't they? There, were, there wasn't. Um, say this one here. So, I guess this one had a bit of variability. It depends what scale, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that is true, especially this one, this one. But I guess the, the whole, like, one thing that would be a lot better would 
So we essentially had polygons that had, say this was 800 meters, this was 600 meters. And then I had to filter it to prevent like stepwise changes in elevation. But the filtering itself was not very good. It was like, I think that's something that can be, that can be improved, that kind of thing. And I think any changes to this would make significant. I guess the context I'm coming from is Tristan Davis is pro model for the sound. It's good. It's a it's um protection of protection symmetry. Uh but as you evolve it, you know the symmetry's broken. Mm -hmm. So it's this crater model. Yeah, yeah, I've right? seen it. Yeah. And so so generally part of the crater you know, breaks and there's a you know there's, there's drainage. Uh -huh. But but the initial conditions in principle uh, are completely symmetric, so you shouldn't be able to break that symmetry. But it's the numerical noise that yeah. comes from the, the, um, the good, good you know, in the grid over the um, over that you know, notion of symmetry yeah. um, initial condition. Oh, okay. um, so if you were to add some noise to that, to that, you, yeah. know, you would then see quite a significant difference in in the evolved crater because it would drain in a completely different place, and of course that's quite a significant mm -hmm. um, topographic feature in the, in the final. Um, result. I mean, simply, you know what I mean. So, yeah. so you could actually, in principle, have it drain anywhere around that. Around that based on the crater. noise that you just, added. Yeah, just based on yeah, based on the, the tiny variations. And, and yeah. so that, I mean, that's sort of a that's a special case because it is symmetric. So mm -hmm. there is a symmetry breaking that is going to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and whereas there's not so many symmetries in, in these no, no. conditions, but nonetheless, I could imagine it would for something like a like. The, the river system, yeah. like that drainage basin, I would imagine. Make a, I, make I, I would guess. Yeah. That's why I was asking the question. Yeah, no, we didn't do anything like that, but that would be interesting to see, definitely. Yes, we're here. Uh, I, I think, uh, thank you very much for this lovely presentation. And I think those things about uh, the, 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 the future work with CDGSS, I hate. we are already working on that. We have just proposed. Uh, then the basic groundwork mm -hmm. where we used MCMC vision inference for bad lens on those very small models. So we are yeah. looking at having a, a vector of uh, rainfall or erodibility mm -hmm. and also those that can vary in time. So at geo different geological time scales, mm -hmm. you, you could have different sets of those values that, that change yeah. over time. And That's really exciting. Yes. It, Yes, and we're looking at a very large scale optimization of inference problems. Yeah, I guess this is quite down the track, yes. right? But and then, uh, I think with those, we could uh, address some of your limitations. Yeah, that's great. That's very exciting. What are you doing next year? Are you continuing? What a question to ask. I don't know. I'm probably still going to be involved a bit, but I don't know if I'll do a PhD next year. I don't know. I'm still taking advice. <laughs> yes. Um, with the modeling based on the Uber network, yep. question was that used um, for the initial stage of um, like the optimization of the parameters, or were you using that after the fact to actually validate? Uh, this. Yeah. yeah. So hold on, I'll show you. The matrix we had. It sounds like he was like, okay, we had this model, we did it for the mm. and then you know, basically it turned out to look good forward. Yeah, so no, it was something we were striving towards. Okay, so, so I guess, yeah, yeah. So we we needed two things. So we needed the, so this is 100 MA and this is 0 MA, and this shows the topography, and then this shows in black the river networks and also erosion and deposition values in the blue and red. So we ran a whole lot of models because we needed, we needed both. We needed the northern drainage and, and no southern drainage at 100 MA, but then we needed southern drainage at zero MA. So we tested different uplift values and um, these are just different, these represent different erodibilities and dynamic topography. But so we were able to say, this is using 50 meters. We were able to eliminate all of this for the uh, uplift because they all had the southern drainage. Yeah. And then these ones, whilst none of them had southern drainage, if we looked at zero MA, then they didn't have southern drainage of the Murray Darling Basin. So which is hard to see, but these black lines don't go south. So we had this middle one to look at, 
So these two were eliminated because they don't have the southern drainage. And eventually it was only this one, which also had this drainage. So it was something that we iteratively eliminated. So the idea this. is that you, you, you want to build an evolution model and input parameters that can reduce the current yes, yes, yes. world and, and uh, geological record, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it doesn't need to exclusively reduce that. Suppose. No, this was just how we interrogated the models. And this was like my problem to solve the whole error mean to see. Mm. And so mm -hmm. I tweaked the model to get this specifically, I guess. But the idea is that we have something at zero MA that looks like, looks exactly like Australia. That would be the idea. Mm -hmm. um, so really <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so if I interrogated this, like, or if I tweaked this model to look like something else specifically, yeah, I guess I just try to produce these things at present day because I couldn't do everything. But um, the idea is eventually, yeah. So what are the parameters that you're um, So, so this is probably taken out of context. I have a few other figures in the thesis, but these are just, um, sorry, the first model runs like model three, model whatever. Um, and so I guess the easy way to look at it is that they vary the scaling of the dynamic topography amplitude. So these two use a scaling of 0 0.75 and these two use scaling of 0 0.65. And I guess the more you scale it down, the less the subsidence, which is why these two don't go completely immersed, like the C doesn't go through the whole, yeah. So this is still some somewhat sensitive. Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. So yeah, it's very sensitive to the scaling of the dynamic topography. I guess one thing I've been wanting to ask, but I think it might be a very, very similar question to yours, is how what kind of tuning model has to be in order, like, to follow these parameters. Do you need to get everything exactly one very specific? Oh, okay. To get those graphs that you're comparing to? Or is, you know, in a yeah. somewhat flexible that a little yeah. bit here and there, like ignore some of the models are really sensitive to and some of the models aren't as sensitive to. So comparing precipitation and erodibility, for example, um, the models don't seem to be too sensitive to precipitation. They can go up and down quite a lot. But as soon as you change the erodibility coefficient, it, uh, the models are very sensitive to that. You can see the inc incision. And so, but yeah, I think you can get the desired output through a lots of different combinations of the parameters, if you know what I mean. I think the idea is to like best, get the best parameters that were the real parameters, like the dynamic topography actually was this, like through sure. time, and right. that's the idea. Um, but I think you can get the output through a com different combination of all the different parameters. Yeah. So I guess then the way I'd say it is if you had, say, three possible mm -hmm. combinations, like very different combinations, uh -huh. they all gave you good results. Yeah. I would consider the best result not to be just the one they gave you. Like, oh, this one looks the most like Australia, but rather the one where a little bit of you know shifting okay. away from those the perfect okay. results still gives you a reasonable value. Yeah. Give you a reasonable yeah. Yeah. I guess the good thing is that. It's not just one output that you're working towards, not just present day topography, mm -hmm. but you're also working towards. So I guess there's going to be a, a lesser chance that a whole different combination will fit all of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. This is going millions of years, and we, we know the fact that the weather system changes so much. I mean, now in the, the Middle East area and Egypt, all those places, two or three thousand years ago, they were really green. So there are some yeah. studies show that. So deserts have formed every two thousand years. So we have a huge variations of rainfall, and and to to capture that is very difficult. But yes. with with the 
large scale optimization and visual information that we are doing in the pipe right now. So what are the like just to be in the context of Australia, mm -hmm. besides the the modality yeah. of the network and the actual like C yeah. is there any other specific branches that you'd be most interested in? Yep. So um where have I got so yeah so this was something we w would have really liked to have done but our models didn't do very well in this regard so this is producing reproducing sediment thickness and stratal units so this is a seismic line that they've shot through a basin which has um, the different stratal units that you can gather from this so the idea is to um, in my last slide there was a synthetic sort of stratal unit and the idea is to be able to match the seismic sections with our predictive units. And that's a bit harder because there's uncertainty in the seismic. The seismic sections are sort of models themselves because you shoot down signals and come up with um, like two-way time, which indicates sediment thickness and, and such. Um, so that's uncertain. So these you would want to match within reason. So that uh, was like these units. So you want to match these with the sediment thicknesses, which and you can extract these from the model at a given two points. You can get uh, the different units. The the different units. Still have this yes, yes. I just didn't do this because they performed very poorly in this instance, um, and it would have voted well for my thesis. But <laughs> exactly. But you can. This that would be something else that we would really want to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.